chairs. Bill, a House Bill 1563. Staff report, please. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairs. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, Matt Sterling, staff to the committee. <clears throat> House Bill 1563 concerns arrest protections for the use of medical cannabis. As background, current law allows persons over 21 years of age to possess limited quantities of cannabis for recreational use. Specific healthcare professionals may also authorize a qualifying patient's medical use of cannabis, which increases the patient's possession limit, per permits home cultivation of cannabis plants, and provides certain legal protections not afforded to recreational users. An authorization is a form developed by the Department of Health that is completed and signed by the healthcare professional. A qualifying patient is a Was Washington resident who is a patient who has been diagnosed as having a terminal or debilitating medical condition and has an authorization from a healthcare professional. A qualifying patient who has a valid authorization may elect to choose to enter into a medical cannabis authorization database and then receive a recognition card. A qualifying patient who has this recognition card may not be arrested, prosecuted, or subject to other criminal sanctions or civil consequences for certain violations of the use and possession of cannabis. To receive these, these protections, the qualifying patient must not exceed the authorized possession limits and must present that, that recognition card upon the request of any law enforcement officer. A qualifying patient who has a valid authorization but is not entered into the database and does not have a recognition card is not granted the same criminal and civil protections. However, the qualifying patient may raise an affirmative defense at trial for certain violations of state law relating to the use and possession of cannabis. House Bill 1563 removes the requirement for a qualifying patient to be entered into the database in order to be protected from arrest, prosecution, and other criminal and civil sanctions. The qualifying patient would still need to comply with the cannabis possession limits and would also need to present that authorization to law enforcement upon request. That concludes my remarks. Happy to try to answer questions. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Seeing none, our sponsor is our co-chair here. Proceed. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, my name is Representative Shelley Kloba, and I represent the 1st Legislative District. And um, as you all know, Washington was on the leading edge of legalizing cannabis, and we created one of the most you know, intensely regulated systems, and that was all a good thing. Uh, it was very prudent, and we've, over time, made some changes, evolved, learned lessons from other states who, who did things differently. And um, in my six years on this committee, it has been my pleasure to get to know patients for whom this is their medicine and um, to get to understand a little bit some of the challenges involved with um, obtaining this medication. And uh, it's, been, it, it's been made clear to me that um, one area of our system that needs to evolve is with regard to the patient protections. And this unequal treatment of some patients versus the others, you know, following all of the rules, but either getting the voluntary uh, entry into the registry or not, suddenly have very different legal options. And we, we heard from the um, very good briefing from Mr. Sterling that, you know, there are six criteria you have to meet to become a, um, a qualified patient. But I want to repeat the part. A qualifying patient or designated provider who has entered into the database and has a recognition card may not be arrested, prosecuted, or subject to other criminal sanctions or civil consequences for certain violations of state law relating to the use and possession of cannabis. And so, the difference between that patient who's following all the rules and somebody who has a different piece of paper or who doesn't have that piece of paper rather, um, it seems contrary to me to um, basic uh, fairness rules. And so um, I can understand that it might have made sense before we had a legal recreational system that 
you know, it's very simple to just go to the store and purchase the pro products that you're looking for. Um, I think there were legitimate concerns that people would game the system and, you know, when we had a medical gray market, um, go through some various hoops to try to, uh, you know, get this little bit of protection. But it doesn't make any sense right now when somebody who's over 21 can walk into a store and purchase their cannabis. So um, I think for me, the main message is that our current policy subjects medical cannabis patients to really a cruel level of uncertainty and uh, vulnerability. And it is time to change the situation so that we treat all qualified patients within the law equally. So uh, this, this bill has passed off the House floor twice with bipartisan support. It has twice gotten stuck across the rotunda in the Rules Committee. Um, but I really hope that you can join me, add some momentum to this bill, and um, we can take care of it and get some fairness for all patients. Thank you so much, and I will appreciate any questions you may have. Committee members, do you have any questions of the sponsor of this bill? Well, you were very clear, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> or they're sleeping. Uh, with that, we will close the public hearing on House Bill 16, 1563. And uh, uh, just to chime, chime in, Madam Chair, sorry to interrupt. I'm just curious, uh, the, the public testimony portion. Um, there I just weren't to any people signed up, but I'll <laughs> double check that. Sweet, are they? Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong screen. Okay, can you, Vice Chair, Chair can you call up our first testifiers? And uh, I, um, th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we, we have uh, eight witnesses signed up. Two are in person and six are remote. So we'll start with the in person of Mr. Arthur West and uh, Ms. Micah Sherman, followed by Mr. John Kingsbury, Ms. Mary Brown and Ms. Lisa Buchanan. Those three are remote and will be on deck. So, Mr. West. Mr. Sherman? Okay. No, no Arthur West. If Arthur were here, he'd be up. Okay. Yeah, you wouldn't miss Arthur. Please proceed. Hi. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thanks, Madam Chair, for. Uh, the opportunity to speak on this great bill. I'm here to speak in favor of HB 1563. For the record, my name is Micah Sherman, and I'm here representing uh, the Washington Sun and Craft Growers Association. Uh, I, uh, as a cannabis farmer who provides uh, plants to medical patients, um, am very appreciative of this bill. I know a, uh, an awful lot of medical patients that will appreciate the clarity in their legal rights that will come with us. and. Uh, I just wanted to um, say that giving, um, you know, normalizing these uh, activities is, is a really important part of the work we're doing here, and I really appreciate um, this bill moving forward, and I hope that it uh, has success across the, what would you say, the other side, uh, yeah, this year. So uh, we're, we're really appreciative of this bill and very supportive of what it's going to do and hope for it to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before you leave, are there any questions of this witness? Thank you. With that, um, with that, uh, we have six more witnesses, um, all remote. And uh, so first will be Mr. John Kingsbury, followed by Ms. Mary Brown and Ms. Lisa Buchanan. And uh, she will be followed by Mr. Taylor Gardner, Mr. Stephen Fields, and Mr. Burl Bryson. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, for the record, my name is John Kingsbury. I'd like to thank the committee for considering this bill. I've been an authorized medical cannabis patient since 2009. After exhausting all other therapies, I carry two cannabis authorizations for two different qualifying conditions written by two board certified physicians who've been treating me for nearly 20 years each. By the spirit and the letter of Washington state law, I am a qualified patient. Prior to 2009, my use of cannabis was rare. 
And yet, even with those credentials, even if I am not committing a crime, Washington state law begins with the assumption that I may be a criminal and I'm not entitled to protection from arrest, even if there is no evidence that I'm violating the law. Let's be clear, arrests of qualifying patients who are not breaking the law does still happen. Here's what that looks like. For some reason, a law enforcement officer comes in contact with an authorized patient. The patient shows the officer their paperwork as required. The officer checks the garden and the number of plants matches the paperwork. The law enforcement officer says, I don't know if this is a valid authorization. Maybe the officer doesn't know the law. Maybe the officer has an anti-cannabis attitude. This is per currently permitted under Washington state law. The patient's garden may be dismantled and seized. Sometimes patients are arrested or given notices to appear. This still happens today. Often these cases are not ultimately prosecuted because there is no crime. But by then these patients who tried to follow the law have had their lives turned upside down. What this bill says is if a properly authorized patient is showing no obvious signs of violating the law, then they can't be arrested, period. If on the other hand, a patient's holding an authorization that says he or she can hold four plants and they're growing 15, this bill would do nothing to protect him or her. To be clear, this bill does nothing to alter the current allowances for medical home growing, nor does it alter who qualifies, nor does it alter any of the current requirements under the law. In Washington state, when I fill an oxycodone prescription, I'm appropriately scrutinized, and after that, I'm assumed to be acting legally. But that's not so with properly authorized cannabis patients who are acting legally. In that case, Washington state begins with the assumption that I'm probably a criminal unless I can prove otherwise by establishing an affirmative defense in a court of law. While this lack of legal protection afforded to properly authorized patients leaves people like me in an unnecessary state of legal vulnerability, it is counterproductive in that it causes us to mistrust the state and to avoid, to avoid engaging with the regulated system, even though we are well qualified. As a matter of public policy, I think this is counterproductive and mean-spirited, and I'm asking you to change that by supporting House Bill 1563. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mary Brown. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is, for the record, my name is Mary Brown, and I'm speaking on behalf of patients in Washington State as a clinician and a cannabis uh, protocol provider to medical professionals. Um, I am in support of this bill. For each of you, I urge that you consider loved ones in your lives that have been sick, that are receiving any type of treatment from any form of med medication. And I ask that you consider the day-to-day -day lives of these patients. As a typical patient, we can go to a pharmacist, we can go to our doctor and get a prescription refilled. When we are looking to provide protection to ourselves and our loved ones in terms of a form a piece of paper, uh, it's not always feasible to get that updated medical recognition card. And as the testimonies before me have stated, it's, it's simply unfair to hold patients to a different standard uh, who are terminal and who actually have more of a difficult time activating on, uh, you know, keeping in quote unquote compliance. Um, so for that, I consider when you have had someone in your life that is sick and you just can't make it to the bank or you just can't make that important meeting you know, that you have to get to, these patients are living this a day-to-day -day life. Their parents are living this in a day-to-day -day life. And simply because uh, you know, the, the minute components of, of being a qualified patient on the registry and not would separate them from having to go through then the added uh, trauma of having to prove their validity of a medical patient is something that is uh, quite frankly outdated. And so I thank you for your consideration. And again, I just ask that you, you think about our patients first and how we can protect them. Thank you. <clears throat> Does the committee have any questions of the testifier? Seeing none. Um, Madam Chair, uh, next will be Ms. Lisa Buchanan. Thank you to the committee for letting me testify today. 
Thank you to the committee for letting me testify today. Uh, my name is Lisa Buchanan and I'm in the quality of life business. I do that in a number of ways here in Washington State. I'm a registered nurse licensed here since 1992 and a founding member of the Cannabis Nurses Network, um, as well as a um, licensed medical cannabis consultant here in Washington. And I see patients every day. So um, I think it's real important to um, focus on the patients here. What they all have in common is that they're in crisis and searching for symptom relief and quality of life that standard medical options have not met. And cannabis offers supportive care, autonomy, and hope for these patients. They are not criminals. And we need not start with the assumption that they are. They're people like you, like your parents, your neighbors, and your coworkers. And they all deserve respect for the personal medical treatment decisions and the presumption of innocent, innocence that every other citizen of Washington receives. Um, it's hard for people to come in. Um, they're worried about their vulnerability. Um, I think it's just ultimately very important to support these patients who have had to really work to get this authorization from their healthcare system, because not every healthcare provider, well, healthcare providers aren't obligated to fill out this authorization. And not every health system allows providers to do this. So it let's step up and let's take care of them. They deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. All right, the vice chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, we'll hear from Taylor Gardner, followed by Stephen Fields and Burl Bryson. Thank you, Chair Kloba and members of the committee. My name is Taylor Gardner. I'm the Deputy Policy Director for the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, here to testify opposed to House Bill 1563. Um, you know, before recreational use was permitted in the state of Washington, arrest protections were implemented for and relied upon by legitimate qualified medical marijuana patients. And these arrest protections required a pre-qualifying assessment and then obtaining a recognition card for purposes of demonstrating it to law enforcement. Under current law, qualified patients and providers have two current protections. They have these arrest protections under certain circumstances, and then they have affirmative defenses. So for post arrest and charge. Um, but with relationship to the arrest protections, a person has those protections if they have a recognition card and they've been entered into the DOH medical marijuana database. And it's through that that officers can independently query and verify a recognition card that's been presented to them. Uh, these components of the RCW were heavily negotiated um, among a large group of stakeholders just several years ago. Our concern is that this bill modifies the arrest protections in a substantive and concerning way. And I, if I could, please let me allow, uh, or please allow me to draw your attention to the bottom of page one, in particular, section one, sub one, paragraph A. So under this bill language, with the changes as they're, as they're written, it would allow for if you have a card and you're in the database, you get arrest protections. But it would also allow if you have a card and you're not in the database, you get arrest protections. And then if you don't have a card and you're not in the database, you still have arrest protections. So based on how it's written, not only could you just not have a card, not be in the database, or in a way that law enforcement could verify, it also opens up the potential for people to forge cards in a way that law enforcement can't verify. And so that begs the question, who wouldn't have arrest protections under the changes elicited here in the bill? So we find that the effective result of these changes is that pretty much everyone has arrest protections, and then that would functionally raise possession limits for all users, medical or not. And that concept is then reinforced by the removal of the affirmative defense piece. So in summary, our concern is not over medical use. It's related very specifically to how a person is required, or in this case, not required to demonstrate their eligibility as a qualified patient or provider covered by those arrest protections as current law provides. 
Um, we encourage consistent and predictable processes and procedures for all qualified medical patients and providers, particularly with regard to medical cannabis use. And so we're happy to be part of any conversations on this moving forward, but I do appreciate your consideration and I'm also happy to stand for any questions. Okay, Representative Kloba has a question. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Madam Chair. Um, this is the first time I've seen you, so um, I have this similar conversation every year with WASPIC, and I appreciate that you always bring forward um, uh, this viewpoint. Um, one of the things that I heard in your testimony that I haven't heard before was um, the notion of uh, faking the authorization card. Now, it's very similar to a prescription in that it um, has to be on a certain specific kind of paper. Uh, there are some safeguards in place there. How often do you uh, think that uh, your law enforcement officers are running into these? And do you have any data on that supposition? So thank you for the question. Um, at my current disposal, I don't have any data to push on that. Our, our concern is just with the potential that arises from the bill language. Um, we're not saying that people commonly forge cards. We're saying that un under this circumstance, they could be forged because of a lack of independent verification on the backside. There wouldn't be any way for law enforcement to verify an authentic um, recognition card. I, I, I'm not sure if I entirely answered your question, but I'm also more than happy to look um, and see if any of our folks have any data to offer you. But I just wanted to reiterate our concern if that, if that was helpful. That would be helpful if you have any data on that as well. Do the committee members have another question? Representative Cheney. Thank you. I, I just want to make sure I understand your organization's position. So are you suggesting that the officers wouldn't understand what is a valid authorization uh, or, or, or a recognition card or both? Thank you. Thank you, Representative. So our concern is a little bit just in general about the inconsistency and in how one would demonstrate their eligibility. So as I cited to you in, in section one of the bill, subsection one, paragraph A, it provides a lot of ors and whether or not they have a card, whether or not they've been authorized, whether or not they're citable in a database, we're concerned about the compounded effect of those that law enforcement would not have the authority to verify that somebody was in fact a qualified medical cannabis uh, qualified patient or, or provider, excuse me. Um, and so our concern is um, with that ambiguity that perhaps we'd be, we would be best be served um, by having consistent processes and procedures and retaining the requirement that these cards and entry into the database, um, th those, stay under, those stay in law and, and allow the law enforcement officer the ability that, to independently verify that somebody is the qualified patient or provider that they're claiming to be. Follow-up question, anybody? I see none. Uh, we will move on and close, or we have more testifiers, do we not? Two more? Thank you. Chair Stearns. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We will uh, lastly hear from Mr. Stephen Fields, followed by Mr. Burl Bryson. <clears throat> Good afternoon. And thank you to the committee for listening. My name is Stephen Field, and I'm here to ask for your support in the passage of HB 1563. I hold the medical marijuana authorization from the Swedish Multiple Sclerosis Center, and I also have a recognition card. I've been living with MS for over 30 years. I also have other health problems, including heart disease and previous heart failure, a seizure disorder for which I take Keppra twice daily, along with my marijuana, and most recently, I had a stroke on December 16th of 2019. I have exhausted all the traditional medical methods in trying to treat my health. At one point, I even had a medication pump implanted in my body, which delivered the drugs directly into my spine. This pump was dangerous. It sent me to the emergency room on more than one occasion when the pump malfunctioned. The former Surgeon General, Jocelyn Elders, concluded that Quote, the evidence is overwhelming that marijuana can relieve certain types of pain, nausea, and vomiting, and other symptoms caused by such illnesses and multiple sclerosis, cancer, and AIDS. 
But even with all these drugs, I still had significant pain. Cannabis, with its natural healing properties, helps me the most without the horrible side effects. And I am just one of the many residents throughout the state that have this need for medical marijuana. Since 2015, when the medical market all but vanished, the products we seek and depend on for our quality of life are extremely hard to find. The DOH website is inaccurate and outdated. I, for example, have to travel 18 miles to even find a dispensary that has a medical cannabis consultant. The dispensary consultant is only there two days a week. Also, the staff is unknowledgeable about DOH compliant product and I am in, <clears throat> and I'm unable to personally locate any compliant products on their website. I am just one of the thousands of patients that have no access to DOH compliant product and many, myself included, would like to also grow this plant at home. And this is just my experience. We do not want to be treated like criminals for the simple act of growing a plant. It should be our choice if we want to grow marijuana in our own homes or purchase at a medical dispensary. We are asking for compassion in the form of common sense legislation through the passage of HB 1563. I am more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions of this testifier? Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, Mr. Burl Bryson. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both of the chairs, the ranking member and the committee for the opportunity to provide comment on this bill. For the record, I'm Burl Bryson. I'm the executive director of the Cannabis Alliance which is dedicated to a vital, ethical, equitable, and sustainable cannabis industry in Washington. And we would briefly like to add our voices to urge you to advance this bill. As most of you know, cannabis patients were left behind in the enactment of I-502. Even jumping through all of the hoops that are required to become on the registry, patients with serious and debilitating ailments are still subject to arrest. Uh, as some of you know, I'm a recovering attorney and I've been a cannabis patient for almost 20 years. Our organization is contacted at least a couple of times a year by patients who have been arrested despite their medical authorization. The assertion that currently arrest protection is afforded is just factually wrong. Currently, patients are afforded an affirmative defense. And as a lawyer, affirmative defense is something that you can present at trial to prove that you are innocent. If you were arrested for murder, you can present the affirmative defense that you were acting in self-defense and that can be proven out at trial. The same occurs here with cannabis. It does not stop gardens from being destroyed, equipment being seized or damaged, the cost of a legal defense, which most patients because of their ailments are unable to afford, does not stop reputations from being destroyed, jobs from being lost and lives from being destroyed. So it is time now that we provide real arrest protection for patients and uh, I urge you to, to advance this bill. Thank you for your time and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Committee members, do you have any questions? Seeing none. Is that our last person? Okay, with that I will close the public hearing on House Bill 1563.